Yeah. Hey, Steve Miller, better known as Kelly's dad, marketing gunslinger, gang. Of course, you probably already know that. I probably already introduced it with my, because you can tell that this is this is Memorex. This is a recorded program right now. I'm going to be talking with my my newest best friend, John Jantz, uh, who, uh, and isn't that what movie reviewers say when they interview the stars? You know, <laughs> stuff like that, right? But John. Uh, has been a uh, he doesn't know this, but he's been he's been kind of a hero of mine, you know, from a distance, a mentor of mine from a distance. Because I mean, I've been in this for a long time, and I'm an inveterate reader. I I read like crazy, and one and a book that came out, and I don't even remember when did duct tape marketing first come out. So duct tape marketing was the title of my first book, and it came out in 2007. 2007. So, yeah. so we're talking 12 years ago. That's great. Um, um, I mean, my first book came out in 1990. Oh. I know you've read it several times. How to get the most out of trade shows. Never mind, but you didn't. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I thought when Duct Tape Marketing came out, I thought that was a fantastic book. Thank Just you. a fantastic book. And you know, and you went on. You went on to have several other books. And in fact, I'm going to tell you that as much as I loved Duct Tape Marketing. This was my favorite book. Yeah, right there, referral engine. So, and everybody that's watching this right now, you you want to get this duct tape marketing. You want to get all this stuff. We're going to talk about his newest book too, but you want to get this because it's orange, as you can see. It's like orange, like uh, like like. But but it's that that one is boy. That one has got lots of uh, notes and stuff like that. Love that stuff. I love that stuff. Um, and um, just just give me a quick, really give me a thirty second Jeopardy. Uh, um, what got you into doing, you know, when duct tape marketing was your first book, what got, what was the background and the impetus behind all that? Sure. Well, I'd had my own marketing firm for over a decade by that point, uh, but it was really just, what do you need? Sure, I can do that, you know, kind of project work, but I love working with small business owners, but they were really hard. Uh, they need needed everything, <laughs> didn't have the budget, didn't have the tension span. Um, and so uh, duct tape marketing talking was- talking to you, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> duct tape marketing was really my attempt to say, okay, how can I how can I put together something where I can say, here's what I'm going to do, here's what you're going to do, here's the results we hope to get, here's what it costs, um, and and so I did that really to kind of solve my frustration, and frankly, I immediately knew I was onto something because uh, it's still today one of the greatest challenges of small business to buy marketing services. Everybody and increasingly everybody is is selling a piece of the puzzle, um, and so what I brought to the world, I think of small business at least, was that. Uh, I'm going to start with strategy before we do tactics, and we're going to then install a marketing system. Um, and that really was the the genesis of duct tape marketing. I gave it a name because I felt felt like it had to be sort of branded, um, and and that was the name I came up with. Well, uh, you know, and it was yeah, it was a great name because you you tied it into saying you need this, you need a tool like like duct tape or something like yeah. that to wrap it, wrap it all yeah. together. But obviously, the idea of small businesses just they, they typically are not thinking strategy. And uh, they, they, they start out with the tactics. And uh, anyway, I don't want to get into all, all, all of that. I, 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 what I want to do is I want to ask you, uh, because, because um, you have a new book out. I do. And I want to get to that. But I want to get to that through your first books. Okay. Okay. And so if, if we talk about, you know, the duct tape marketing, uh, the referral engine, and then duct tape selling, mm -hmm. as it, for me, those are the three Mm -hmm. Primary books. Did you? I'm going to be stupid here. Did Did you write some other books? Because those are the uh, only three that I have. Yeah, I've actually written a couple other books. One very specific on uh, search engine optimization called SEO for Growth. Okay. Um, and then another one called the Commitment Engine, which was really um, a little more about what it takes from a mindset standpoint to to grow a business. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which Which kind of gets you closer to this. It does. Book. Right. Yep. yep. Uh, so, so let me ask you about duct tape marketing. What do you mm -hmm. What do you think now that it's twelve years uh, since then? What have you heard from people, or what do you feel has was was the biggest the biggest takeaway people True. had from duct tape marketing? Well, I, you know, it sounds so, it's, it's almost sad in a way, but you know, the still today, I mean, because I haven't, you know, I still preach and teach and I've revised duct tape marketing once. I'm working on the second revision uh, that'll come out next year. Um, so it's continued to evolve, but this approach of strategy before tactics, um, I, you know, I've said that phrase probably six million times and I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say it another 60 million because it hasn't really sunk in. In fact, Google, Google the term marketing strategy and you'll, you'll find a bunch of blog posts that list 15 
tactics <laughs> to grow That's your right. business. That's right. um, and it, it still hasn't sunk home exactly what a marketing strategy is, I think, for a lot of people and why it's so important. Um, and, and what I tell people all the time is, is in a lot of ways, if you get the strategy right, which is going to involve, you know, your ideal customer and the value that you bring to them and your big differentiator um, and how you go to market and how you serve your clients. I mean, that's the, the essence of strategy. Some of the tactics almost don't matter anymore because, uh, you know, or at least the idea that you got to jump on the next new one that comes along. Um, if you have your strategy right, uh, you will grow your business. Yeah, I I come 100% uh, on board with you uh, on that, and and I still hear you know you know 30 30 plus years later since I started all this is is every day I'm listening to people and and I just go look guys you know <laughs> let's figure out your strategy first and then we'll then we'll get into then we'll worry about whether you use social media or not. Yeah. you know I mean it's 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 like that okay so then um, referral engine yes all right which I like I say I love because <laughs> I, and again small businesses really rely heavily on referrals. They, they all do. And none of them have a plan for that. Yeah. They just let it happen. Yeah. And, and that was really um, why I wrote the referral engine, because in working with at that point, you know, over a decade of working with small business owners, I mean, that's what I discovered is that, you know, 75, 80 percent of their business, at least the best business came by way of referral. But nobody did anything about it. You know, it was kind of like, do good work and referrals will come. I don't want to go ask for them and beg for them. Um, and so I wrote that book really as kind of a roadmap for a first how to be more referable, because let's face it, you know, I can't tell you all the secret ninja tricks to get more referrals if, if you know, you're, you're not, not doing referrable. a good job. Of, that, was, right? that was always rule number one when I would say to people, they, I would say rule number one is you must be yeah, referrable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then, you know, just, I just, I had worked with a lot of businesses, seen good things. I had implemented a lot of good things in terms of, of actual intentional practices to, to generate or amplify your referability. And so that, that was really why I wrote uh, the referral engine. And, and I wouldn't say it's a follow up to duct tape marketing, uh, but it certainly, it certainly shares a lot of the same idea about the customer journey and about yeah. you know, developing a marketing strategy for yeah, sure. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So then duct tape selling, which. Right has to be a follow-up to, to, to marketing. Yeah, it, it, it is very much a follow-up to duct tape marketing, but it was what it was also um, meant to be is an acknowledgement that the world of selling or the traditional salesperson had changed dramatically. And it's actually, in my opinion, shifted a little more towards being a marketer, building authority, building expertise, being seen as uh, a value player in the chain as opposed to an information deliverer because, you know, the information's all online. Information. Already. <laughs> we don't own the information. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that it, you know, I was encouraging with, um, independent salespeople, people who are in a sales role for their company, even founders who thought selling was just going out and, and you know, calling on people, uh, that they actually had to do some things that, that were really traditionally more in the marketer's um, basket. Yeah, well, even understanding their marketplace yeah, yeah. Uh, better, than any, better than anybody else. And I, I, I'm, I'm a, a fan of Peter Drucker. I am and, too. Uh, you know, Drucker... My favorite, you know, uh, quotes from him are, are number one. He says, "He said, you know, the purpose of business is to create a customer." That's right. Boom. Everything yeah. else follows behind that. And then he said, "He said, and because the purpose of business is to is to create a customer, there are only two functions of a business. One is marketing, and one is innovation." And then he said, "And and if and the purpose of marketing is to make sales selling superfluous." <laughs> right. So, see, so it's interesting that you say that. That even today, the good salespeople actually are, in essence, good marketers too. That, that's right. That's they right. might have a face-to-face -face ultimately that most marketers don't have. But, um, but I, 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 I really agree a lot with what Drucker said when he said, you know, if you really are good at marketing, um, it makes your sell, sales, if not necessarily superfluous, but makes it so much easier. Yeah, so that's much right. Easier. That's right. That's so, right. So now, throughout all of this. And then, and then your the other book that you talk about, the, the, say it again, the commitment, the commitment engine, yeah, the it commitment was engine, right. came came right um, after the referral. You engine. know, so you had some something must have been going on in your in if if your brain is any anything like mine, you know, you've just got you, the the back of your head is always thinking, you know, there's something, there's something I'm not talking about here. Yeah, yeah, right. That's really really important. And I need to figure out what that is. 
because that's that's the sense I'm getting from uh, your new book. Yeah. So I mean, in, in, in so people have. Ask, why did you write this book? Uh, this is very different for you. <laughs> um, and and the first answer, frankly, is, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I've written five books about marketing. Maybe I was a little burned out, you know, in terms of writing about marketing again. Or maybe I felt like I had most of what I needed to say about how to do marketing. Right. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I won't come back and write another one uh, someday. But uh, there was a sense in me that I, I, I personally was exploring maybe and have been exploring for the last two decades, you know, why I'm doing this, um, you know, what value I'm bringing to the world, the impact I want to have. Um, and, and I've just, I've really been a student of, you know, of the self, if you will. I mean, trying to, you know, constantly work on myself, build a better me so I could build a better business. Mm -hmm. And there, there definitely were, were things I've noticed, I've witnessed, I've practiced, you know, that I feel like have been a, as much a part of whatever I would call success um, as, you know, any of the book sales that I've had. Do you feel that, do you feel that the, I mean, as much as you say it was, uh, uh, might be like a self-discovery type of, uh, type of journey uh, that you were on, because um, you're still walking this journey of, of small business people, right? You bet. I mean, you're around a lot of small businesses, you you're consulting for them, you're speaking to the audiences, you know, you know like, like I do. Uh, and, and then you're meeting with people who are founders of companies, uh, small businesses. Uh, and, um, and, and w did you feel like you were seeing something missing? Well, I, I've said for a long time that I, you know, one of the, things that drives me is trying to help small business owners figure this marketing thing out because I think it is what's holding them back a lot. Um, I think one of the greatest things in the world is to be able to own your own business. I think it's the most freeing, happiest you know, thing that somebody should pursue. Absolutely. But I also see it sucking the life out of people. Sucks um, the life out of people. <laughs> well, for a lot of folks because they, they can't get this marketing thing right. right. Um, and, and so that's really driven me for, for, my whole career, really, it's it's what's driven me to build certain things, do certain things, put in so much, give away so much, uh, because that's my true mission is is to help those folks. I really love small business owners, yeah. um, and so this book, in a lot of ways, is, is not that far off of what I've been doing. Um, you know, marketing. I think in a lot of ways, marketing. I've said for years, marketing is everything in a small business. Everything that goes on. It is everything. It is well, marketing. it's everything in any business. It's everything in any business. Yeah. But but. Um, but I find it really hard to convince big, big companies of that, which yeah. is why. And, and, and so, you know, my heart is in the small to mid-sized businesses, right. like, like I think yours are, yours, yours is. And because we're talking to the, to the person who is writing the checks, we're talking nah, to the right. person who's, it, it's their money yep. and stuff, which I love talking to that person. Yep. I love talking to that person. And, uh, and almost with, without question, when I am working with somebody who has had some modicum of success, they have this other side of them, you know, where there's much more to it yeah. than just building a widget. Yeah. yeah. I, I would agree. I would agree. How would, how would you describe, I, I mean, that must have helped you um, in, not just in your journey, but also helped you in, you know, even deciding to write this. Yeah. Because uh, you I, and I both know, all right, first question, is there a market? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think that there's a tremendous market, I, I, especially. Um, so, so this maybe we better set this up a little bit. It, it, it is a very different, you know, structure of a book. So it's uh, here. I've, I've, oh, I've I was going to get to that. But it's even okay. Got, oh, it's even got orange. Right it's there. even See, orange. All I have, but, all I have is, uh, you know, I mean, thank you for, the, oh, you know, and, and I, I buzzed through a bunch of that, and I'm telling you, I, I can't wait to get the book. <laughs> well, thank you. So it, it's a daily book. So every day you get a, a new reading. So it's not meant to be, oh, I'm going to pick it up and read the thing. Now I'm self-reliant. It, uh, it is uh, every day you get um, a new idea, a new inspirational reading from uh, some what I think is still today some of the best uh, entrepreneur writing you know ever created. Then I kind of contextualize it for today uh, with my experience. And then I leave you every day with a challenge question. Yeah, so, let's, so, so let me back you up just a second on right. that one now, all right? Is is that you you went from traditional book writing. Yes. To how we basically say, okay, you know, here's why you suck and here's what you need to do to get better at it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you, you, you turned it into a, but you used a format right. that is much more in the idea of a daily devotional. It is. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's what it is. Yep. Uh, and, you know, and I read through a bunch of them uh, and, you know, but the, but unlike most devotionals that I have, you know, books that I have seen this one, I had to, I had to pay attention 
and I had to really <laughs> think about what I was reading. Yep. 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 So so you chose uh, you chose you chose this format, but then you chose to use twelve, um, and they're not necessarily just all authors, yeah. but they are writers in a certain sense. Okay. That's right. Uh, and you chose people from way back. Yeah. As being your examples. Yes. And then kind of tagging along with them, like like each month you have a different, you know, person. Like like my birth month was, you know, July, I figure I gotta go look at July. <laughs> you know, is uh um I think it's Emily Dickinson is mine. Uh one let's see, just I think it was I think it was Emily Dickinson. And so I thought, oh, Emily Dickinson, you know. Now, what the heck does she have to do with entrepreneurs? <laughs> well, so so actually, the way the book is structured um, is um, I did I did open every chat every month with uh, featuring an author to give you a little bit of um, of a flavor of that person's history. But what I actually chose was a vein of literature, most of which was written in the mid nineteenth century, from about eighteen forty to eighteen eighty. So if you think about what was going on in that time in a, in the United States, at least we were on the cusp of the Civil War. We were trying to abolish slavery. We were certainly very culturally, politically divided. Women were marching on this in the streets to get the right to vote. Um, and so the writing that came out of that period was some of the first really counter cultural writing in the United States. I mean, it was a time when people are saying, hey, you don't have to listen to your preacher or your politician or even your parents. You need to start following your own path. And even a lot of the protagonists from some of the fiction work uh, of that time, like the Scarlet Letter and, and Little Women and Moby Dick, the protagonists in, in those were all very self-reliant, um, mm -hmm. meaning that they, 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 decided to trust their own path and their own journey and their own heart, you know, as to for what they were going to pursue rather than just follow the well-worn path of others that came before them. Um, there was a lot of writing that was very overt. I mean, the essays of Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and Thoreau, you know, were very much saying, hey, do your own thing. Um, and I just, I just think that as I got deeper into it and, and a lot of entrepreneurs, I see Pinterest and Instagram quotes from Emerson and Thoreau. I mean, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs have already kind of embraced some of those thinkers. But as I got deeper into it, I found that th that's what was being written about completely in, in that time frame in America. And I just thought, man, those messages are so spot on for what entrepreneurs need to do. Well, I don't think, I don't think necessarily the people today, you know, the, like you talk about the ones on, you know, where they're using quotes. I think they're, yeah. I think they're looking for quotes. Yeah, you that's know, right. You know, I'm a '60s kid, so somebody like like Thoreau, you know, was a huge influence back, in, yep. you know, yep. to me back when I was growing up, and yep. and um and 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 so I thought it was interesting that all of a sudden I'm I'm looking at him again. I'm going, wait, is he back in my life now? You know? <laughs> like, like, like wait, wait a minute, what does this have to do? You know, what does this have to do with this? But but at the same time, like like you and I had, you know, we also did a uh, when you interviewed me for my book, Uncopyable. And in, in my book, Uncopyable, a, a, a big one of the, the the big strategies of being uncopyable is when I say steal genius. Yeah, yeah. And stealing genius means to leave your comfort zone, leave your your world, and go find somebody who's doing something very very cool, very smart, and and take that and bring it back into into your world. And so that was my that was one of my first thing reactions when I started to go through this, um, your, your your new book. I thought he's stealing some really amazing geniuses yeah but but you know even i it, it didn't occur to me to go look at you know somebody like louisa may alcott and and that oh i could take some ideas from her well and and one of the things that i did um once you started getting into or once i started getting into research and i did i spent about six months doing none of my research on this um is that you know, a lot of particularly female uh, writers at the time, a lot of their work was really buried or not brought to light at all and until later, much later in life, uh, given the times we were in. Um, and so when I got into actually their letters and journals and things that have now been collected and are in archives and things, I mean, you really got into some depth. It wasn't just the, you know, the pithy little quotes that uh, can go on a t-shirt. I mean, you, you really, there was so much material there. Um, and again, I, th I think this these themes of trusting yourself, you know, f finding your purpose by, you know, by experiencing life, um, you know, having Road less tremendous travel, right? empathy for everything around you, you know, yeah. I mean, it's just the themes are just over and over again, and I think they're so strong for entrepreneurs. Yeah. What did, um, so as you were going through this researching journey, mm -hmm. you know, and you already kind of had the idea, right, I'm going to go study these people. Yep. Um, and, um, you know, a little more than maybe I already have, and I'm going to really see how I can tie them into, um, you know, you know, my tribe. 
Uh, and uh, what what was the what, what did you learn? I mean, what what did you feel were the, were the biggest? Did you did you already just touch on it when you you know just now? Um, I started to touch on it. A couple of things I learned. One was how relevant. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I would read a passage and go, "That couldn't have been written 150 years ago." Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're still having that problem, <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> um, and and wait, so that so that wait, was amazing. You mean politics politicians were back there then too. <laughs> it's not it's, naming anybody. Not yeah, naming anybody. No, no, it's amazing though. I mean, I think there are some parallels to where maybe we find ourselves today, and a lot of historians I think would suggest that there there is a kind of repeating. And, and cycling of, of, you know, generational kind of happenings. And so I, I do feel like we're, we may be back in a, a little bit of that same sort of uh, feeling. And I've always felt that entrepreneurs, quite frankly, I, I think, I think entrepreneurs are the, are the, the do-gooders of the world in a lot of cases. I mean, they're the ones out trying to solve wrongs and bring new things to life and um, employ people. And, and so, you know, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, I've, I've gone as far as suggesting that, that, you know, a lot more self-reliant entrepreneurs might actually be one of the ways to kind of bring us back to a unified us. Okay. You guys listening to this? <laughs> 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 I mean, that's kind of, it. and, and uh, I can't disagree with that. Yeah. I cannot disagree yeah. with that. I mean, we, you know, the entrepreneurs I think are, are the engine of the world. Yeah. And, Me too. And, um, you know, and most, most entrepreneurs that I have gotten to know um, over my life, these these people, they they really are. They're trying to change something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, it might might not be something you know, you, you know, world changing or anything like that. Uh, but but they do try to change something, and that to me is a very noble, um, uh, right purpose in life is to, uh, you know, if you're able, you know what, I think, I think one of the most noble things you can do in the, in the world is employ people, Yeah. you yeah. know, is, is have, have employees who you are paying and they are able to take care of their, their lives and things like that, which to me, uh, uh, entrepreneurs are, are the, the best, best at doing it. But you've got, you got these, you know, like, I'm, I'm looking at the list of, uh, the list of your authors. Yeah. Okay. And I already mentioned, uh, Louisa May Alcott and Emily Dickinson. Um, I recognize, you know, I, I knew all, all but two, uh, oh, great, which, yeah. which I was surprised that you threw a couple of wild cards in there. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, and as much as I, I, I wanted to be surprised at Frederick Douglass, I guess I wasn't surprised yeah. at Frederick Doug Douglass, um, but Margaret Fuller, yeah. I, I didn't know who she, I, I mean, Margaret Fuller and Willa Carter. No, Willa Carter, Cather. Cather. Cather, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, yeah. have, don't have my readers on. <laughs> sorry. Margaret Cather. Can you just tell us real quickly who they yes. are? Yes. So, so Margaret Fuller is uh, really an amazing story. I mean, she, I mean, anyone who's studied, you know, feminist literature, particularly, I mean, they know who Margaret Fuller is. I mean, she, she was kind of the first American woman to write about uh, women's rights and was really the leader of the suffrage movement. And the reason you don't know more about her, she died in her twenties. Um, so oh, she did? Yeah, she oh, did. I, didn't, I guess I didn't, she, didn't catch that. Part. I saw yeah. that she was the first woman in Harvard Library. <laughs> first woman allowed in the Harvard Library. I've she, never been allowed in Harvard Library, <laughs> so I think that's pretty damn yeah. good. She she um uh, was actually the first woman publisher of a you know major daily paper. It was in the UK, not in the US, but I mean, and in her twenties, I mean, she was amazingly wow. accomplished. Uh, wow. But but again, died very young. Uh, but but actually, you know, left quite a body of work. But again, given our history, given our time, you know, the era, a lot of that work didn't really come to life um, in, until, in some cases, the last, uh, you know, couple decades. Wow. The um, Willa Cather is one that you probably, when I tell, when I say some titles, you might know her because some of her books have actually been turned into movies. So she wrote Oh Pioneer and My Antonia and uh, I can't remember now, the third, the Song of the Lark was mm -hmm. the third in a trilogy that, you know, are very, uh, really almost kind of created uh, that plains um you know literature because all of it was about kind of the pioneers uh, stretching out to um to the west and so her she actually falls a little outside of uh, the time frame but she was very influenced by the writers uh, that that I but I'm just a big fan of hers I, I love Willa Cather well i mean just just you know in the brief time that i was able to kind of go through the the book um you know like i thought it was fascinating that herman melville mm. uh dedicated 
Moby Dick to Nathaniel Hawthorne. I did yes. not know that. <laughs> well, so one of the things I learned, and it really doesn't surprise me. It did at the time, but then I got thinking, well, I've had lots of authors that are friends, you know, especially business I, book authors you know and things. Good point. <laughs> and they I were not occurred of it. They were all really good friends. I mean, they hung out in the same places. They went to the same social media conferences, well, or something like that. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they were. They, they they actually were quite good friends. And there was, the, you know, there were a lot of letters back and forth to each other. Uh, Thoreau wrote lots of letters to to Hawthorne and to. Uh, to Emerson and um, and their letters are where I found I thought some of the best stuff you know frankly because mm -hmm. they were in some ways they weren't trying to write about you know something they were actually in some in some cases explaining an issue they were having to a friend and it um, and I, I thought it was really beautifully written of course they they also didn't use any emojis so it was uh, a lot better writing so oh was was it harder to read because you couldn't <laughs> you know, tell <laughs> there, there actually, you know, there there were some cases that the the language was much more flowery yeah. than we use today. Oh, yeah. No question. Oh, yeah. um, there's some terms that are maybe a little antiquated. Um, I, I did actually make a little effort to uh, modernize pronouns in a lot of the writing, uh, oh. just because you know it just was to always. Kind of make it, yeah, yeah. Make make yeah. it easier. Who I uh, th this this question just popped into my head of of the list. Um, who was the number one person that you picked because you you just said I got to have this person. Well, I started the book without question, knowing that, I mean, the title is a nod to an essay by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson right, uh, called right. Self-Reliance. So I started knowing I was going to quote a lot of Ralph Waldo Emerson, and I also knew I was going to quote a lot of uh, Henry David Thoreau. And I would say that I I, I need to go through and count someday. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll do that uh, uh, some winter day, but I, I yeah. suspect those two get name-checked more than anybody in the book. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and of course, you know, Mark Twain... Mm -hmm. um, uh, huge favorite of mine. I mean, for a lot of reasons, just because. Yeah. Well, and and have you ever have you ever read a book? Maybe it was about a totally unrelated topic, but you went into it thinking about, I'm going to read this book looking for ideas about you know X. So I've sure. I've done that like with architecture books and things, you know, because they talk beautifully about patterns and yep. and about communities and things. So if you pick up. <laughs> The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and read it thinking of looking for entrepreneurial themes. I mean, they abound. Okay. <laughs> you know, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer were so self-reliant. Yeah, they um, were. That's and, right. And he, and he really, Twain really made them, you know, the, the storyline in a lot of books like that in that era was, you know, do good and God will provide for you, you know, and, and, do and good, the, work hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do and, good, work and, hard. And, and and in these books, you know, it was a lot more about, you know, follow your truth and sometimes you're going to get in trouble and sometimes you're going to have to figure your way out, you know, but it, it's, uh, you know, if you read it with that sort of context, it's yeah. amazing. Do you think that, do you think that all of these, uh, do you think the idea of self-reliance was kind of on their minds completely? I shouldn't say completely, but I mean, you know, do you feel I, like that was something that they, they felt? Because, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurs. Yeah. And, and the lesson that I think when you say self-reliance yeah. to entrepreneurs today, I, th I think they can take it one of two ways. Uh, there's no question. I mean, if you Google self-reliance, you're going to you're going to find sites that teach you how to like live off the land and do your own thing and not depend on anybody. Right. Um, but uh, that's not certainly what I meant. Um, what I meant was that you know that that it's I mean. You could, you could substitute the word for self-trust. I mean, you have to trust yourself enough <laughs> to, to know that, you know, you shouldn't be controlled by what others think you should do or say you should do or, you know, what others are doing, um, on one hand. And you also have to trust yourself enough to let go con of the things that you can't control, um, mm -hmm. which are most things. I mean, the only thing we really can control is how we show up and how we respond to what happens to us. That's it. Right. right. <laughs> well, and that there are a lot of things, especially when we are the boss. Yeah. Okay. It's up to us to find the answer. That's right. That's right. It's up to us to to, to come up with the solution that's going to. Yeah. So we have to be self reliant. Yeah, but but there's also what's interesting and ironic a bit is is there's a lot a lot in the literature and I write about this um, also suggests that part of our job is to prove ourselves wrong that if we have all the answers and we aren't willing to change our mind and we aren't empathetic you know to other people's situations then we're not going to grow we're not going to evolve I mean if 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 we think we have to have all the answers or that we do have all the answers uh, we're not going to grow and so a lot of this incur a lot of the writing or there are certainly entries that encourage you to find a better way and you know follow that path if it makes sense and certainly one of the ways you do that is you go out and you listen to other people and you experience other things um, and that's how you're actually going to learn what's you know your true path but but you don't have to hold on to your you know your past beliefs if, if something else rings truer then then you should follow that 
I don't think you're right about that. No, <laughs> no of course I think you're right about that. It's in my book. <laughs> you know, you got to expose yourself to new things. That's you know, right. And, and it, you know, because because uh, you can't, uh, you know, I think the idea of saying that you, you you believe you're right. Well, you might believe you're right, but it's within this context, right? You know, right. and if you don't go out and spread, you know, spread your experience and your perspective uh, to where you you do see things through through different eyes, um, then you know. You're, you're very narrow. You have a very narrow uh, uh, viewpoint. Well, and, and a lot of times I think entrepreneurs run the trap. People run the trap of feeling like, look, this is what people believe I am or who they believe I am. And I don't want to let them down. <laughs> and sometimes that what they believe I am is really not, you know, fully realized me. Yeah, um, yeah. And oh, yeah. <laughs> and well, I think how many that, of us? Yeah. How many of us? Uh, and I say I say us because, you know, for, for you know, I've had that situation you know, where I kind of think, well, oh, I sure hope they don't figure out. <laughs> right. figure it out that I don't know all the answers right yeah, yeah. Uh, you know I'm just you know or, or th those of us that you know fake it till we make it you know, type, type of well thing. an example I use all the time that a lot of people can relate to as silly as it is you know how many how many really accomplished go-getter people out there that, that are changing the world um, you know are out there with one face on and then they go like to their family or their high school friends or something and all of a sudden they revert back to this smallish person that, that they believe that that's who that person is and um, you know I think I think a lot of people are guilty of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, very quickly, I'm going to relate an <laughs> incident that happened to me three weeks ago at my, and I'm sorry to say this, my 50th high school class reunion, um, which was filled with nothing but yeah. old people. Um, but I was, you know, I was having dinner with a bunch of people and there were some, some of the old popular cheerleaders and stuff like that sitting there. And, 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 and we were going around the table with this kind of fun, fun thing where, where we were saying, is there, was there anybody that we had a crush on in high school um, that we never told them, right? And, uh, you know, because, you know, that's, you're living that, that moment, right? Of back yeah. when you were the kid in high school, right? Yeah, we're yeah. sitting there and, and, you know, they're looking at me, you know, I'm, now I'm known as the guy who, you know, I'm the author, I'm the speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm this, this type of stuff. So I'm sitting here and then I go, yeah, I, I had a massive crush on you. <laughs> I, you know, and I, I point to I point to one of the women sitting there at the table, and and I said, you, you know, I had a crush on you, and she looked at me and she said, I don't even remember you. <laughs> All right. You know, and I thought, I thought, wow, I'm back in high school again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, those different roles that we play, yep. you know, and and you're exactly right. So, um, you know, I, I this is really fun, uh, but um, well, can I, I su can I can I suggest something, Steve? Um, Alexa, I'm, I'm like I'm going to say, what are we not talking about? Yeah, all right. So one of the things that I have done that might be interesting um, in in other shows that I've been on is because this is uh, you know a page is two minutes. We've been talking about what's on a page, so why don't we read a page? Um, and because it'll okay. take two minutes, and uh, pe people get it, it's you know us marketers, it's a free sample. Um, that, that they get, That's a good and, idea. <laughs> uh, but I think it'll also give people. I mean, they'll definitely know what we're talking about now. All right, which one do you pick? I just, you know, I, I pulled one up here that was sitting on my desk, and uh, uh, so I'm going to read it. It actually is from the Scarlet Letter, is where the quote's from. So okay. the way the way it's structured is, I give every day a title, then you've got the quote, then you've got um, me reading the uh, my riff on it, and then the challenge question. Cool. All right, so here we go. Congruence. No person for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be the true. Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter, uh, 1850. Quite often, the very thing that leads many to strike out on their own is an attempt to bring their business and personal lives in alignment. The corporate culture they'd entered and adopted no longer feels congruent with their personal goals. Congruence, by definition, implies sameness, agreement, harmony, or compatibility all concepts made wholly real by following an entrepreneurial vision. So it's terribly ironic then that when the amazing fresh opportunity afforded the entrepreneur is coupled with the day-to-day -day pressure to build a business, people are easily pushed further and faster out of congruence than when they started. Remember playing crack the whip at the ice skating rink as a kid? It kind of feels like that. This looks like working more hours than is healthy or necessary, promoting products and services you don't use or believe in, asking others to do things you are unwilling to do or worse, wearing one face to yourself and another to your team, your employees, and your loved ones. In geometry, when stating that two triangles are congruent, you might use a complicated congruence statement. In your entrepreneurial quest, 
it's even more complex. So your challenge question for today, how is your life a reflection of the gift you need to bring to others and how is it not? Say the question again. How is your life a reflection of the gift you need to bring to others and how is it not? Yeah, I see that's a great question for entrepreneurs. Uh, um, and and I'm, I'm glad you thought of this to do that because I thought, I thought how, how can we kind of show them uh, how this format is set, yeah. is set up and uh, and just, you know, that's one day. That's one day. That's one yeah. day. And uh, um, uh, so you know, a chunk chunk to think of for that one day. <laughs> it is a chunk to think of. And, I, and yeah. you know, when I was going through, you know, I was I was reflecting on some of the some of the challenge questions. And did, do you have a favorite challenge question that's in the, in the book? Uh, I, I, you know, it's funny. People have started to ask me, what's your favorite reading and who's your favorite author? And, and I, I thought that was very I thought that was a great. I, I love that one. And, and the idea behind this book is that you're not going to pick this up and read it and go, Oh, I got this self-reliance thing figured out. I, I actually refer to this as a practice. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that, so, so let's say you read that one for the day and now you go out into the day and hopefully somewhere planted in your mind is this thing of like, am I, are my actions and words, you know, uh, aligned? Am I, you know, are there cases where I'm doing, you know, so it's not that you're going to, make some big change. I think the first step is to start actually reflecting on and witnessing when it's occurring because mm -hmm. you can't, you can't make a change until you do that, you know, that first step. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I gotta, I gotta believe that this kind of, uh, um, what's the word? Scrambled your brain a little bit when you were yeah. putting this together? <laughs> it, well, first off, a couple of things for people who have written books. It's much harder to write short entries <laughs> than it is to go on for 10,000 words. The old, that's, 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 uh, well, we both know that. But, I, you know, that's the old speech. You yes. know, that's the old Winston Churchill. You know, he, he, somebody asked him how long to, you know, he, could he give a speech? And he said, how long do you want? And he said, well, why, why do you, you know, how much? And he says, well, you know, if, if you want 20 minutes, it's going to take me a week to put that together. <laughs> You, you know, if you wanted four hours, I could start right now. <laughs> that, that, that's right. Or, or there's a quote attributed to Mark Twain. I, I would have written a much shorter letter had I had more time. Had more time. That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> but, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so that scrambles your brain, but also, you know, you, you want to have, you want to think deeply about this yourself and reflect on it. And, um, and, and in the course of writing this, I, you know, I, I, I have a, I have a day job um, as well. And so, you know, I did a lot of writing on weekends. And uh, I mean, it was, it was tough to write. I think my record may have been 10 entries in, in a day, in that's one day. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. That's but I did that. I did that only a couple of times. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. I can appreciate how hard that is yeah. to do that. So, yeah. uh, uh, John Jantz, um, author of great books, The Duct Tape Marketing, Referral Engine, Duct Tape Selling. Uh, you know, books I talked about has a new one yeah. that is called The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur. Uh, and is it ready now? Is it coming it's, well, depending upon when people are listening to this, October 22nd, uh, 2019. And you can find all about it at uh, selfreliantentrepreneur.com. And you may have to Google those words because uh, nobody can spell self-reliant entrepreneur. But but you'll get close. And, yeah, I'll put it in the notes <laughs> and, and put it online so they, they can... Uh, um, they can click and go yeah. and go there and pre-order the book. I already pre-ordered it, um, even though I do have the, the copy that you sent me. But uh, um, you know, it's it's. I'm anxious to stick it by my bed, or, or actually, I think I'm going to have it here in my office, and I'm going to. It's just going to be something part of part of my beginning of my day with, you know, when I, when I come in here. So yeah. no, that's actually my hope for a lot of people because it can fit in, and have, every page has a couple of lines at the end, so you can even jot some notes. You know, after you read the question, Ooh, if you I want, can wreck so that's the book. it. I love you can wreck the book. And this was I put my foot down to the publisher. I I, I had him put a ribbon in it so that you know you can keep your place. Uh, well, there's a ribbon. <laughs> there's a ribbon in it. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had a ribbon in my book. <laughs> yeah, that, that was well. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, where the inspiration is funny. You mentioned Peter Drucker, uh, but a couple decades ago, I picked up the Daily Drucker, and it was a similar format to this. Somebody had curated um, many of his works and put them into kind of this daily I, format with an action got it step. On my shelf right back and, and it has a ribbon in it. And ever since then, I wanted to have a book that had a ribbon in it. So you're going to have a nice, <laughs> nice blue ribbon in your book. That's, that's a good aspiration, I think. I'm going to have it for my next one. <laughs> so, okay. Hey, John, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, uh, great talking to you. Uh, and I, I hope we talk again in the future yeah. and, and share some more crazy ideas. Good luck with your book. Thanks you know, so much, Steve. Knock it out of the park. So thanks for joining me. Thank you, Steve.